Hi, this is um, one of our monthly presentations from the Carbondale Age Friendly Commun Age Friendly Carbondale uh, organization, and um, David Teitler, our local famous acupuncturist and mycologist. <laughs> <laughs> has volunteered, has kindly um, accepted our invitation to talk to us about all things mushrooms. Um, he's got about four topics. There's kind of magic mushroom, psychedelic kind of stuff that maybe we'll talk to about at the end. But before that, you want to talk about, he'll take it away. He'll talk <laughs> about it. Questions and answers, interrupt him if you have some burning questions. Uh, interrupt him if you have a burning question. Um, but we'll have a, we'll have a Q&A at the various times, too. All right. Well, so I'm here to talk about mushrooms, one of my favorite topics, actually. <laughs> um, so I guess we have a few people in the audience and people out in uh, cyberspace. I don't know if cyberspace people, can they type in questions or anything? Um, OK, so they can, you can type in questions. I can't see them, so someone would have to interrupt me and let me know what a question is. And I'm happy to answer them. So if you guys have questions as we go, uh, I think feel free to raise your hand and I guess you'll have to speak into a mic. Um, well, as Susan said, I'm Dave Teitler. I, um, I grew up in Crested Butte uh, where there were a lot of um, old time miners who came to America from, from Europe, like Italy, Croatia, Serbia, Slovenia. And in all those countries, there's a big uh, mushrooming heritage amongst like Eastern Europeans. And so when all of those people who came to work in the mines in Crested Butte found out that the same mushrooms grew around Crested Butte that grew where they came from, I think they were quite pleased. And so there was a, a pretty strong mushrooming community and spirit from the folks that we called the old timers, who were the miners. And so a lot of, I think what I learned was kind of stuff that was, I guess, handed down from the old timers to the hippies who moved in in the 70s and 80s. And then I learned a lot from, from them. And then over the years, I've read and learned stuff as well. So from a foraging perspective, that's kind of where my background comes. Medicinally, I'm an herbalist by profession, acupuncturist and herbalist. And within our herbal pharmacopoeia are a lot of mushrooms. And there's a lot of intrinsic value within the mushrooms that um, is particularly effective as an herbal. So there's the foraging part, there's the medicinal part, and then, then there's the psychedelic part, which um, seems to be a hot topic these days, interesting topic these days. And there's a lot of research and work being done in that realm as well. So those were the kind of the three realms I wanted to talk about, foraging, medicinal, and psilocybin. Is anyone, um, any of those areas that anyone's particularly interested in talking about or hearing about or have specific questions about? I, it's not a specific question, but I love to eat mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So the question is, in what ways are mushrooms good for you? Because this fellow likes to eat them. And so you're wondering about like a nutritional. Yeah. Nutritional. OK. Um, well, then let's start off with foraging. Um, so here in Colorado, we have kind of a, a smaller season for foraging, pretty much July and August is the main foraging season here in Colorado. Um, if you're in the Northwest or in California or back East where it rains a lot more, then the seasons are much more extended. 
But here, since we don't get a ton of rain, it's when the monsoons come in July and August, is if they come, then we will have mushrooms growing. Some seasons it doesn't rain enough and there's literally no mushrooms in the forest. And so that's a bad year. And then we have to wait till next year and keep our fingers crossed that it will rain. You know, a lot of snow helps, but I think in the end it still ends up just being, does it rain in June and July and August is really um, the de a deciding factor. And then, um, yeah, I'll go through some pictures to show you some types of mushrooms you can find. Um, but one thing that's really interesting about mushrooms and that people are learning more and more about is this kind of symbi symbiotic relationship between mushrooms and other plants or trees in the forest particularly. And so the word for that is mycorrhizal. And so the word mycorrhizal means that there's a beneficial relationship between the fungus and the plant, say a pine tree. And so the mycelium of the mushroom, so the mushroom, like in this picture, that's like the fruiting body. So that's like an apple on an apple tree. Whereas underground, you have the mycelium, which is like the tree to that apple. So underground, there's this network of, it's mycelium. It's like little silky, fibery stuff that goes everywhere. And so for, you know, the mushroom you see, there's, you know, just miles of this like underground network of, of the mycelium. And this, so that's like the tree or the, the body of the, um, the plant. And so these little fibers interact with the rootlets of the trees and they exchange, well, the tree gives the mycelium and the mushroom like um, sugars and fructose that they get from photosynthesis to help the mushroom grow. And then the mushroom supplies like minerals and vitamins and other micronutrients to the tree. So it's this kind of symbiotic relationship. Is mycelium microscopic or macro? The question is, is mycelium microscopic or macroscopic? It's probably both, but sometimes like if you're digging in a garden and something's rotting and you see all those kind of little white, hairy, spidery web things, that's mycelium. Is it always white? Uh, that's a good question. Is it always white? Probably not, but it usually seems to be. I suspect there's all different, probably, little variations on it. So, so this mycelium is everywhere in the forest. And so the kind of term, the wood wide web has been used, but it actually is kind of like the internet in that trees actually send signals to one another chemical signals through the wood wide web, this mycelium. For instance, if one plant is being attacked by, say, aphids, and so it excretes a chemical to ward off the aphids, it will also kind of send a signal to the other plants and trees in the forest I don't know, it's not words, but it's saying something like, beware of an aphid attack, get your defenses ready. Like it's not, they're not typing it in and hitting send, but some sort of chemical is going through the hypha, the mycelium, and so these plants actually do communicate with one another. And then they can also share um, nutrients. So like if a big tree is growing and in, it, in the shade are little uh, baby trees coming up, but they can't get enough sun to photosynthesize to keep growing, the parent tree can send nutrients through the soil, through the mycelium to um, the other members of its family, so to speak. Um, so, so all this is to say that you might pick a mushroom, 
but underneath there's under the ground there's a lot going on. So I want to bring up the examples of um, morel, morels in a, in a forest. Who knows morels? Anyone know morel mushrooms? Here's a little jar of morel mushrooms that I picked from uh, so morels in Colorado will grow the year after a forest fire. So there was the Sylvan Lake fire two years ago. And so last year, we went there and you could pick a lot of morels there that come up the next year in the spring when it rains. So morels are actually kind of the exception to that July, August thing. They actually come up in the spring. Oh, when do they come up? At, at the lower elevations of around 8,000 feet, they come up, um, they come up May, June. And then if it keeps raining, they'll kind of go up the mountain as, as the summer goes along. I'm just checking to see. Yeah, something went off there. OK, so shall I keep talking? while wow, my technical help is here. <laughs> um, so, so these morels, they come up the year after a fire. If you Google why do morels come up after a fire, nobody knows. No one even really has a great guess other than maybe, no, actually no one really knows why. But here's what I find interesting is if a morel will come up after a fire in Colorado anytime there's a forest fire, that means everywhere in every forest, this mycelium of morel mushrooms is just alive and hanging out and waiting to reproduce, like spread its its seed, so to speak. So I just find it fascinating that every forest you walk through, there is just these morel mycelium waiting to grow, waiting for a forest fire that might hit every mountain, what? Every hundreds of years. It's going to be hundreds of years before any given forest is going to burn. And then this fungus. It's not a plant, it's not an animal, it's a fungus. It's just hanging out, waiting for that opportune moment to, to grow. So I think that's really cool. And, um, and then they throw out their spores, and then they wait for the forest to regenerate, hang out until the next fire comes in 2187 or whatever. It just, it just happens once, or will it continue to happen? happen just once every forest fire, or does it continue to happen after the fire, you know, in decreasing, decreasing degrees? It's pretty much like just that first year. One year. And if it didn't, if there wasn't any rain that first year, sometimes year two or year three you can get some, some to grow. But um, usually it's just one, one sprout and then they're done. So Basalt Mountain, or fire in Basalt Mountain like four years ago? I, there were probably millions of morels on Basalt Mountain that year. Uh, like literally, you could just walk if you knew, figured out where to go, and there were just endless numbers of them. So that was very fun. So is that to say that, so if it's like a tree, we don't have apple trees and fruit and apple trees and pear trees and cherry trees all growing from the same trunk. I mean, we can graft them together and do that. But so I'm getting this picture of the mycelia that's all intertwined when I dig a spade full of dirt that will grow different mushrooms. Correct. And, and some years, if it's the right conditions, like heat or something, something triggers fire morel to go. The, fire the and next rain, year. yeah. Um, are the other mushrooms subdued that next year? No, no probably not Or will not you see morels coming up with uh, other kinds of mushrooms altogether? You could, except the morels come up at a different time. 
of the year. So really, it would pretty much be them. But the point is, yeah, so the analogy of the tree is, is maybe better said like, if you pick a mushroom, it doesn't kill the organism any more than picking an apple off a tree kills an apple tree. So that's the analogy. So there's all different kinds of mushroom trees to keep the analogy going, growing underground. Or in your garden, it's just whatever's rotting in the compost or whatever. But it's still fungal. But, and if it rains a lot and you water a lot, maybe a mushroom will come up in your garden, right? Some random mushroom or something. But you know, lots of times it's just the mycelium and it won't sprout because the conditions aren't just right. Like uh, one of the mushroom, well, yeah. So um, let's just look at some mushrooms that you could collect in the forest. We're going to go through some pictures um, so you can just see what, what is out there. All these pictures were taken one day on a particularly amazingly great day from a mushroom looker like myself. Um, I went to the forest to try and find chanterelles. It had been raining a lot, and it had been raining a lot that year, so I felt optimistic. Um, and there were mushrooms everywhere. So this picture you see right now, these are amanitas. Amanitas are the, the Alice in Wonderland one, the red one with the white spots. Um, the red one with the white spots. Usually you just see them like that or then they're dead, but somehow this year they just went through their life cycle amazingly to just make these incredibly cool looking old Amanitas. So these are like grandpas and grandmas. Um, so scrolling through, here's a couple other mushrooms I saw that day. The, the yellow one is that coral mushroom I think you were talking about. Um, Coral mushroom is kind of the common name for it. It's Ramaria. Um, those are thought to be edible with the caveat that sometimes you can get the runs if you eat them. But they're generally thought of as edible. The ones on the left are Rushulas, some kind of Rushula. Those ones would probably make you sick. David, we have a question from somebody catching us virtually. Sure. So one of our virtual participants is asking, is it possible that when indigenous people used fire to manage the forest, morals would have been more frequent? Uh, I mean, that would kind of be, I guess, a side effect for uh, managing the forest with fires. I think any time you would, I mean, more frequent than what? More frequent than when we have forest fires these days? I think any time you would burn a a uh, coniferous forest, you could get morels the next year. So I would imagine the native people, I don't know if that's why they would make the, the forest fires necessarily, but if they made a fire, they probably would know that morels could in fact um, sprout up the next year in great proliferation. And you could pick gunny sacks of them and then dry them and then have them to eat. So I, I would imagine that would be part of the native knowledge, I would definitely think. Um, so this is an Amanita mushroom, probably much like one imagines seeing one, the Alice in Wonderland, um, Amanita muscaria. It is poisonous. There is a way to like triple cook it and get the toxins out. And then I'm told it tastes pretty good, actually. But I've never tried that. I had a friend who tried eating it once to get high. And all he got was sick. Um, but um, yeah, so this mushroom, the Amanita, that particular day was out in force. Here's another picture of an older one. It's just basically the same mushroom I'm going to guess a week or two older, something like that. This is a Boletus, also known as Porcini. Um, probably one of the two choice edibles in Colorado. 
they taste really good. They're best when they're about this big or smaller. When they get bigger, they start to get wormy and mealy and yeah. So this is a couple more Amanitas. They were just crazy that day. The white one is just a baby nub just come up. And this is an old one, uh, another three older ones. I think I called them Amanita babushkas because that's what they look like. <laughs> um, and then this little graphic is kind of, I just took a picture of, uh-oh, let's see, there we go, of the life cycle. So we go from baby to, I guess, teenager in all its glory, middle age spreading, uh, getting a little older, and then quite old. And, you know, it, it's really kind of uncommon to really see this much, all these varieties, but that day it was just a really great day. So. This one's called a hawkswing. They're quite common in the pine forests around here. They're edible. And the, if, you, the small, if you get the smaller ones, they taste better. They start to get kind of woody. Um, Mark Fisher likes to use them in dried up in soups as a soup stock. And then I just made this little graphic of fungal seascapes because it just looked like underwater stuff. You got this kind of coral looking one, which is called coral. No, what's it called? Anyways, these little purple ones, they're actually edible. They kind of taste good, but they just boil, cook down to nothing. Here's another of the coral ones, a few more older Amanitas, and then a, an old coral here. Then we've got this orange one goes by the name Lactarius deliciosus. Um, and uh, it's known to be rich in proteins, crude fiber, unsaturated fatty acids, and it has B vitamins, Lactarius deliciosus. And then the white one's a puffball. Those are just a little puffball. Sometimes you get those big ones, but these are little ones. Those are edible. Tastes kind of like tofu in that they'll acquire whatever taste it, they're cooked in. So this is one of those middle-aged spreading Amanitas from underneath. That is the mother bear who was yelling at me as I was <laughs> sitting there in the chanterelle patch. She was angry. That's for stories for another day. And so these are chanterelles. This is what chanterelles look like in the forest. They're probably the other prime edible in Colorado, Belitas and chanterelles. Um, I knew a guy once named John Mark who was a chef and a mushroom collector. And the quote of his I like is, um, there are two kinds of mushrooms in Colorado, Belitas and chanterelles and everything else. So the point being that they're the ones that really taste good. These are Belitas porcinis that just overgrew and just started looking pretty weird. So do you eat the whole thing, the tops? Well, the, that young one I showed you earlier, you would eat the whole thing, yeah. top and stem. These ones? These ones you wouldn't eat. These are too old. They'd be wormy and yucky, but they're cool looking. One more old babushka and the cute little, these ones, I don't know what they were. I could never identify them. And then, so this is the same anim, Amanita that would have been the red one, but it's growing in a dry air, on a dry south facing slope. So that's what it ends up looking like, but same mushroom. And uh, so, yeah, so. That was one day of foraging. I did collect a bunch of chanterelles in my basket, and then that bear started yelling at me from the tree because I did not know the patch was literally right below her in the tree. So that was exciting. Scared the shit out of me, actually, <laughs> when she started going 
And I'm like, what is that? I, I saw, saw her. But what magazine was that article in? Uh, it's, it, it never really made it in a magazine. It was in a mushrooming journal, and it's on my website. So if you go to CarbondaleAcupuncture.com, to the links and blogs section, you can see the article and read it and look at the pictures. Um, so any other questions about foraging before we move on to the topic of, let's say, medicinal values? I got one. So the, everything that I've known that people forage, they always cook. They never eat raw. But the ones that we get from the grocery store, they're fine to eat raw. Or is they... I mean, not fine to I eat. think the. I mean, I guess you can eat those button mushrooms raw, but I think it's always best to cook. The conventional wisdom is always best to cook mushrooms. And as you'll about to find out in the medicinal part of the talk, is that the the polysaccharides in the mushrooms, the sugars that are the immune building uh, parts, are only water soluble. So you have to cook them in water, like steam them to break those cell walls down so that these polysaccharides are viable. If you because if you just eat that mushroom, it's just going to go right through your system and the, the healthy part will then just come out. Can so you cook them in oil? If you it, same thing. If you cook them in oil, the um, some constituents will come out, but to get the polysaccharides, which is the uh, most healthy part, the anti-cancer part, the immune building part, it's got to be cooked in water, you got to steam it to, get, to break that down those cell walls and make them um, digestible. So then portobello mushrooms, which they say you can grill portobello mushrooms grilled? Um, well, probably there's a, a big water content in them already. So I think if you grill them, it probably breaks that down. Um, but it's always... I think it's best to steam mushrooms and then throw your butter or your oil in at the end for flavor, but to cook them first in water or even dry cook them in the pan and let the water of the fresh mushrooms bleed out and then steam and it'll steam that way. But if it's dried mushrooms, then you've got to add water, but you're already going to be adding water there. Yeah. Can you say something about farming them? Because I suspect Actually, I do all of these stores. <laughs> and um, the ones, obviously, you know, they don't, people aren't out foraging for those and then bringing them to the stores. How are they farmed? Well, I don't know a ton of that other than pictures I've seen, but um, they just have these big, kind of humid, correct temperature, ideally situated little labs where they grow them in. Uh, that Mike just went backwards. Um, I don't know too much about that, other than they just try and recreate some sort of natural habitat, and then they can grow lots of them at the same I, time. I don't have a mic, so maybe, Alice, you could repeat it, but um, when I was a child, um, we visited they were grown commercially, commercially in Kingston, New York. So he was saying they're grown in a cave, right, because so it's humid there, and um, so they can grow. I don't know. Some don't need light, and some do need light. You know, so it's the only place I've ever seen. It's, it, it's just that different. Yeah, so each different mushroom is going to have an ideal growing situation. And so whoever grows whatever strain of mushroom probably knows what that, that um, habitat is. Okay, so medicinally, in mushrooms, it's these polysaccharides, these little sugar um, chain, sugar molecules that are really good for the immune building part and um, kind of for the anti-cancer part, which is kind of medicinally what mushrooms are best known for. So, um, and usually when it's anti-cancer, it's not killing cancer cells. It's called host-mediated response. It's building up our immune systems so that our immune systems are more agile and able to fight off, stop the proliferation. So it's really tuning our engines, not so much killing the cancer cells. So in my clinic, in my acupuncture and herbal practice, I use these mushrooms a lot 
for people to help strengthen the immune system, strengthen their immune system. And so to use mushrooms or any other sort of herbal or food property to strengthen um, your immune system, it's something that you've got to do over a period of time, months, to build up your strength. So I kind of might, the analogy I like to use is the moat around, the mo a moat around a castle. So if our body is the castle and the moat is our immune system, you know, you, you dig the moat wider and deeper in times of peace when there's no barbarians attacking. So you eat your mushrooms, take your herbs to strengthen, eat well, exercise, de-stress to strengthen your immune system. So you're digging the moat wider and deeper. But then when the virus arrives or the Vikings from the north come down, then, so if they're attacking you, that's not the time to, oh, I'm going to grab my shovel and dig the moat a little bit better. That's the time to get spears and arrows and hot oil and fight back. So then you would use a different class of herbs if you're getting sick. You don't just keep taking your immune builders because then you've got to take things that are antiviral, antibacterial, golden seal, echinacea, any number of products one could take um, to fight off. But so when you're building your immune system, digging the moat deeper, that's when you're taking these medicinal mushrooms and other herbals or healthy foods to strengthen your body. So really in the anti-cancer and the immune building, it's a similar idea. You're, you're, you're stimulating the body's ability to build uh, T cells and helper cells and the immune modulating cells within the body. These polysaccharide chains promote that. As far as the anti-cancer goes, there are a few mushrooms that are particular. There's one called turkey tail, also known as Coriolis, also known as Traumatis versicolor. It just grows on dead wood in kind of the shape of a fan and it has these kind of rings of color. But this herb um, has a particular polysaccharide that helps the body's immune system when it's fighting cancer. In Japan, it's an actual drug. You, like if you're getting chemotherapy for colon cancer or breast cancer or other cancers in Japan, they might also give you this whatever, however they extracted this medicine from this mushroom in addition to the chemotherapy and radiation. Also, uh, maitake mushrooms is frequently used in Asia for conjunctively with uh, other therapies for fighting cancer. And pretty much any mushrooms, men, most mushrooms you eat will have these sugars. Like if you're cooking with mushrooms and it bleeds out that liquid and then you cook it down a little and that liquid thickens up a little bit, does that? Those are those sugars, because they're kind of that liquid is kind of sweet. So it's these sugar chains. That's the good stuff. Drink that. Yeah. And like the porcini mushrooms, uh, the bolitas, this one, when you cook those, it just makes a nice, thick, kind of, you know, juicy sauce. And so the bolitas is rich in polysaccharides and alkaloids, um, and uh, let's see in my notes, also high in proteins. Um, and so, you know, I recently came across a source that talked about the different micronutrients in, in mushrooms. But personally, like especially like foraged mushrooms, I just think, you know, each, each different mushroom's going to have pull something different out of the forest you know, talk about an organic garden. That's like been organic for the last zillion years. Like, it's, there's going to be good stuff in there. So I kind of just trust that if I eat a wide variety of foraged mushrooms, I will have a wide variety of great nutrients for myself. Um, 
Any questions on immune system and medicinal use of herbs? I was curious about the morels. They have specific. Um, I was wondering if the morels had a specific medicinal um, use. According to my source right here, they are rich in B vitamins, B1, B2, and B12. And then my other source from fungusamongus.com, take that for what you will, vitamin D, proteins, vitamin D, and vitamin B, and other riboflavin, niacin, thiamine, and minerals, potassium, copper, and selenium. Um, but yeah, and then it says it protects the stomach, nourishes lungs, and strengthens immunity for morels. So in your, one of your treatment rooms, you have a wall full of herbs and jars of things. Are a lot of those mushrooms? About five of them. So in traditional Chinese medicine, they use mushrooms amongst other plants in what we call herbal medicine. There's also some animal-based products in there and mineral-based products in what Chinese medicine just kind of calls herbs generic generally. But there are probably like six or seven different herbs we use in Chinese medicine. One is good for strengthening digestive system. A couple are good for strengthening kind of the kidney and bladder function. Um, but there's a few different ones we use. And you buy those? I buy those. Yeah. So, uh, they're, so cordyceps. they're being harvested in China somewhere? Yeah, they're, they're probably being cultivated. cultivated. But there's one famous herb, cordyceps. Who's heard of cordyceps? Anyone heard of cordyceps? It is actually a parasitic fungus. It invades a the larva of a particular moth in the Tibetan plateau and over just infiltrates its body and just kind of sucks the life out of the larva and itself grows in there and then sticks up this one tiny little mushroom at sometime in the summer, way up high in the Tibetan Plateau. And so that particular Chinese herb, which is like about as expensive as gold by weight, but it's a very common and esteemed herb that is used for um, athletic performance, sexual performance, being more um, dynamic in old age. Um, it apparently was used by the Chinese once in one of the Olympics when all of a sudden they came out of nowhere and broke all these records and Everyone thought they were doping, but what they said was we were dosing on cordyceps. And you now, have that one. I do have that one. <laughs> but nowadays that's cultivated uh, in labs, not so, but they can't get the mushroom to sprout in captivity. It can only get the mycelium to grow. But these qualities are also in the mycelium. There's another, there's another, uh, variety of it, of it that's being grown in captivity that does sprout a mushroom, but it's a, it's a different um, subspecies. Different, uh, I don't, that's not quite the word, but um, a different type of cordyceps. But apparently it still has good medicinal value, so they say. Cordyceps militaris, as opposed to cordyceps sinensis, which is the Chinese one. Uh, medicinal, any other medicinal questions? Should we go on to psilocybin? Has anyone read Michael Pollan's book? Everyone, <laughs> a lot of people. So that's a great history on the psilocybin. You know, it's quite interesting, and I didn't know until recently that it was greatly studied at the greatest medical uh, teaching colleges in America, Johns Hopkins, Harvard, all those were studying psilocybin for the use in 
psychotherapy for depression, anxiety, and it had great promise. But then the hippies got a hold of acid and psilocybin and started using it recreationally, and so the government worried, I don't know about what, that people might get too creative or <laughs> too crazy or whatever, and so they kind of, the government kind of shut down all the research with psychedelics and psilocybin, and I think in the last 10 years or so, that research is starting back up and continues to be promising. Um, so psilocybin these days is used, well, at least in clinical settings, it's thought to be appropriate for treatment-resistant depression and anxiety. So that means you've been depressed for a long time and therapy and medication doesn't seem to be helping. And so psychedelics, psilocybin, um, MDMA, that's known as ecstasy, molly, so I'm told. <laughs> um, those are all the same, I think. Um, and then uh, ketamine is quite often used these days as a kind of a psychedelic therapeutic in clinical settings. You can get that in the valley here with a guide and a doctor to help you process it. And it does seem to be very effective. I take that back. Many people tell me that it has helped them a lot. I'll just throw one example out. I, uh, I know someone whose daughter was quite depressed, suicidal. She went through about five ketamine infusions here in the valley. And the mom told me that her daughter was like a new person, not feeling suicidal and feeling much happier than she had been using the ketamine treatment. As far as psilocybin mushrooms go, it can be used similarly to help with tr treatment-resistant depression. I think what mushro psilocybin mushrooms is good for is giving someone new perspective. I'm not saying anyone in here has tried them recreationally, but maybe if you have, it it opens new thought pathways and new, 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 can kind of help give new perspective. And so one use that psilocybin is, is kind of end of life, whether it's someone with terminal cancer or maybe some disease that it's just a kind of a wasting away or like when the, you know, the end's in sight and just, so a lot of people are kind of like, why am I living? What's the point? Anxious, depressed. And so in these situations, but particularly in cancer where it seems like the most research has been done, there even one dosage, one experience, I'll, I'll read you what, what um, and this is from an NIH study when administered under psychologically supportive double-blind conditions, a single dose of psilocybin produced substantial and enduring decreases in depressed mood and anxiety, along with increases in quality of life and decreases in death anxiety in patients with a life-threatening cancer diagnosis. Rating by patients themselves, clinicians, and community observers suggested that these effects endured at least six months. The overall rate of clinical response at six months on clinical rated depression and anxiety was 78 and 83 percent, respectively. And anecdotally, I've, I've, it, it supports what I've just heard from people. So I think it's that kind of help gives perspective on 
you know, what these remaining months of my life might be like. Um, and uh, there are phase two trials going on right now at Dana-Farber Cancer Center. That's in at Boston, in Boston. Uh, I don't remember which hospital. But they're working on morale of the cancer patient, the sense of helplessness and hopelessness and loss of meaning and purpose in life, which then can lead to the anxiety and depression. So same idea. So they're actually doing a clinical trial. They're pro I don't know how you placebo a psychedelic trip, but they're doing it. <laughs> Maybe they just play Alice in Wonderland with everyone. And, you know, I, I don't know. But, um, but I think the point being that there's a lot of promise for using um, psilocybin to help people with real, real um, health issues. And then there's microdosing, which is very popular these days. And so in microdosing, you're taking a, a dose that you don't feel. So like you, don't, you wouldn't know that you've taken it like you don't experience the high or the trip. And you take it in this small dose, maybe 10 days on, a couple days off, or something like that. And the idea of microdosing is to help, I think I have this right. It, it, the mushrooms, alone, like lion's mane is another mushroom that will do this, kind of helps nerves regenerate and creates new neural pathways in the body. Um, so if we take PTSD, or any sort of trauma as a disease uh, category. Lots of times in trauma, you're just going back to this same neural experience of the trauma. So these mushrooms help create new neural connections, can help reroute some of the um, the brain's kind of processing or that same kind of pathway that it just is stuck in. And so using mushrooms, either microdosing or macrodosing in a guided trip, both have seemed to be effective in treating both trauma, just trauma in general and PTSD uh, specifically. You can read many anecdotes of that, and um, yeah. Any psilocybin questions? Who, who in the valley would, would do that, and what qualifications would they have? Are we off the record? No, we're still on the record here, so. <laughs> we are on the record. Um, can you talk to? Why, is that an iffy kind of thing? Well, the legality is kind of iffy. Like, I think, is it in, just in Denver, I think it's legal, that psilocybin is legalized, but not in Colorado. Uh, exactly. It's, it was, well, it's been decriminalized, but it was also statewide. We voted last year. Oh, that's year. right. We passed that statewide. We passed it, but it's not in effect yet. It's like got a 18 months, two years. So it's decriminalized to possess, but I don't know if it's decriminalized to grow it. <laughs> You can grow it? You can grow it. You can't sell it, I don't think. Anyways, you can give it to somebody. I'll talk to you after. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are ways to get it. I think we're OK if that's off at this point. Um, yeah. You, I guess you've got to snoop around. But So what's your question? How could I get some? Or who is qualified to? Be the guide. Yeah, how, is it, how is it administered? Like for some, how would it be administered for someone who has PTSD or trauma or one of those? Conditions? I think the best way to do it is you is you find there are people who are guides, and so the traditional way to do this, like Michael Pollan did in the book, you take a pretty large dose, you're blindfolded, and you're just laying there. So it's not like you're walking through the forest tripping. You're just there blindfolded, and your mind does whatever it's going to do. But there's also a guide sitting next to you, a shaman, call this person what you will, who then 
kind of helps you process or just helps you through your trip and then in the end helps you kind of come back to the more uh, corporeal plane and uh, helps you integrate what you've just experienced. Because some trips are good, some trips are bad, some trips are in between, especially at this really kind of high dose, kind of higher dose than you would do recreationally. But what qualifications would someone have then? Yeah. <laughs> It's it's pretty that's great. Part of, that's part it's of what a, we voted on. It's a pretty. There will be a licensing procedure. It's very gray at the moment. It's a pretty gray area. Um, I think they should pretty much hang a shingle right now and say I can do this and this, and I have done this and this is what I've done. Um, it's it's pretty gray at the moment. Um, but that being said. I know of people who do this service for folks, and I don't know if they're good at it or not, actually. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a pretty gray. I think if you give us a few years, there's going to be some clarification on that, but hopefully it won't become too clarified that there's too many hoops to go through, because it is plant medicine, like that law that passed really was for plant medicine, so I think, I personally think probably the less regulations, the better. In the book, I'm trying to think, it wasn't the pollen book, it was another one, um, talked about microdosing and Burning Man and, and all of that, that microdosing was a, has been a big, a big thing for quite some time now. I'm sure it is, um, and macrodosing. And, and the, the, like you say, the, the opening up of expanding neural pathways, opening up, getting you out of rutted thinking, um, that sort of thing. And so I've been wondering about that one because I've heard people going to Denver and doing a microdosing couples session and you know, various things like that. And I haven't really heard back from them <laughs> what, what they got out of it. And so that was curious to me that you could get, I hadn't heard what you said about microdosing, that it needs to go on for many, many days. Yeah, I think microdosing generally goes on for many days. I think if it's a couple's retreat for a weekend, I think it'd be more likely macrodosing. Yeah. Like, that would be my guess. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a very nascent... Um, sector of, of care, and a lot of it is still kind of underground. Some of it's becoming more overground. I know there was just a talk at Valley View Hospital a few weeks ago or a month or two ago about a talk by a qualified person to the staff. It wasn't to the public about what he has learned about using psilocybin for um, psych psychiatrics and psychological use. I think it's... Um, yeah, it's. Is it, do you, mushrooms in general, I mean, psilocybin mushroom therapy, does it have, uh, react with, say, somebody's taking seizure meds or, you know, like some meds don't mix? Is there issues with, with that? Probably. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even know, you know? I mean, you know? How much food did you eat before you take them, right? Like, I mean, I, I, think, I, I think only Lore knows those answers right now. I don't know that, I mean, you could Google it and see. Yeah, just wonder. <laughs> you know, it used to be if you Googled that, then they'd be on to you, but now I think it's, it's okay to Google that stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. To know, do you know anything about psilocybin and avoiding stomach issues with it? Like how to avoid stomach issues when you take psilocybin? I've read orange juice or citric. I, I had a friend who once made it up, cooked it up as tea, and that was easier on the stomach. Mm -hmm. That was his idea. And also, I'm sorry. Are you uh, maybe have a little food in your stomach. Actually, I don't know. 
Some people get sick when they take it. Some people get nauseous and some people don't get anything. I don't know anything particularly a good way to, to get around that necessarily. Um, I also wanted to ask you about, do you know about a microdosing schedule? Why it, you said 10 days and then two days? Or I mean, I just kind of threw that out there. I just know you want, I think it's generally it's more effective if it's done at a low dose consistently. Um, again, I would just Google that. But I've, I, you, you could probably get 10 different answers from 10 different websites. But it's low dose over time is the idea of microdosing, not just a couple couple days. So I'm changing the subject a little bit. The, the work that I know you do with herbal medicines and formulas for people, um, with current political issues with China, are you having difficulty getting ingredients? No. no. I'm currently not having trouble getting herbs. In fact, more and more of them I'm able to get organically and pesticide free. Almost all the herbs now I can get either organic or tested pesticide free, sulfur free. They're way cleaner than they used to be. From China? From China. Um, and seemingly higher quality and quite a bit more expensive. But I think the quality is very good. And China generally sends their best herbs out. They export the best quality. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, co to comment, Dave, that you know the reason you're not able to answer some of these questions very precisely we have the same problem with marijuana, which is now totally legal, you know, in so many states, and uh, because um, we haven't been allowed to study it. It's it's what happens when you um, put a lid on people's quest for knowledge. It, it becomes word of mouth, and and that's the best you can do. Yeah. Yeah, because ev even with marijuana, I mean, sure, you can go into this dispensary and some guy who has some six-week certification is going to give you a lot of, about, of advice about which of his products works for what and how to take it, but you can go down the street and get totally different advice. This is true. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah. And, you know, since the legality is a little hazy, I just, I don't, I just don't want to go on the record saying things that could either... Well, anyways, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, any other questions or anything else you wanted me to speak on? Anything from online people? Thank you very much, David. Thank Thanks, you all. <laughs>